Hey everybody, we're getting ready for our Sunday school lesson once again. It's Sunday, July 19th. I um, want to give everybody the proper credit for this. This is the Word of Flame curriculum printed out from the Pentecostal Publishing House. I want to kind of give them a thank you uh, to them for having this literature available. Um, got a really good lesson today. It's so far this quarter, it's one of my personal favorites, as me and Sister Sheena was talking about it just before I came over here to the church. Um, it's a really good one, so hope y'all get your get your lesson book out. Maybe grab your Bible. We may go to, we may go to some scriptures later that's not in it, but match up with it. So we're gonna look at it. It's got some really fun stuff. Something at the towards the end of it's gonna come out um, that I never knew before. This story I've heard all through childhood in Sunday school class, but um, I tell my my past Sunday school teachers y'all kind of. They kind of cut the story short. There's an interesting ending to this. The title of the lesson is A Humbled Leper. And if you're thinking Naaman, you're, you're, you're in the right ballpark. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Our focus thought is that God delivers those who humble themselves. Humbleness. Humble, however you want to pronounce. I know there's a proper way to do it. A non-proper way, and I just don't really, you know, you know what I'm talking about. That is so paramount in our walk with God is humbling ourselves to Him, to His direction, to His Word, to His will. Um, you know, it, it, we've seen it. You know, we've some of us has went through it. Some of us experienced it personally. Um, humbleness to receive His Holy Spirit. You know, we've seen people come down to the altar and time and time again, service after service, pray, just striving to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and it just doesn't seem like it was ever going to happen. Almost maybe thought it might have been impossible. You feel like when it's you, you feel like it's impossible. And then, thankfully, they eventually do pray through, and then someone else begins to come up, and the very first time their knees hit the little cushion right there on the altar, it, the Holy Ghost falls on them. They begin to speak in other tongues as the evidence of it, and you kind of wonder, well, why did this be so easier for so much easier for them? Was they were able to humble themselves. You know, pride is a very hard thing to, to fight against. And that's what it's going to look at this morning. Uh, looking at our focus verse for this morning. Now, before I read this, I'm going to throw out, I'm going to be checking this phone uh, more often than I normally do. Uh, last Wednesday night, if you, if you keep up with our videos and you're up to date with everything, you know, it was a two-part message. It wasn't two parts because Brother Ray got too long-winded. No, no, no. It wasn't anything like that. It was the phone was, was cutting off, and luckily people would notice it, and they would come up, and they would hit record. So we was trying to get as much of it as possible for everybody that couldn't be here. And it ended up being, I think it was a two-part, might have been three, but I know it was at least two. But Sister Sheena did tell me as we were coming over here to set everything up that it was a memory issue with her phone, but she had remedied that, and it should not have any problems. But with my track record with technology, I'm going to stay a little bit on the safe side and no idea what I just did. There we go. And just check it every few minutes to make sure that it hasn't cut off. That way, if it has, I can just hit record again and can keep going. Love y'all. I don't mind doing it, but it gets frustrating sometimes when we have to do these lessons two or three times over because it never feels like you can ever get that first time you did it back. You know, that first time we did it, that was, that, that was God. Yeah, we studied the lesson out. We read over it. Put, Sister Sheena put together the slideshow, and then we go over it together. But you still allow God to insert Him, not me. When you go doing it two and three and four times, I know I'm chasing the rabbit on that, but just kind of letting y'all know a little bit of the struggle that we have with this thing. Haven't had to do it in a while. It's been working great for the last several weeks, so hopefully we'll just continue right along with that. But uh, just in case I didn't tell you, this is July the 19th, and we're on lesson number seven, titled A Humble Leper. And our focus verse for today is 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? 
How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Back up a little bit for our lesson text. We'll talk a little bit later on from 8 to 1, and then it'll come out a little bit, some, some scriptures after what we're focusing on right here. But for the lesson text, starting in verse 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him, that's a, that's a key thing to remember, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought, that's another thing, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand, look at this phrase, and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, had to humble himself, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Here's our lesson text. Now um, we'll read our cultural connection. In December of 1999, while in the Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchman, Ron repented of his sins and was filled with the Holy Ghost. Over time, he took correspondence Bible school courses to become a minister, and he studied some law to try and get his conviction overturned. He had a stellar reputation inside the prison and earned the trust of the warden and the officers. He was known for his ministry and the quality work he did all over the prison campus. Ron had family, friends, pastors, and business owners write letters to the governor. He did everything in his power to gain his release. In all of that, every door closed. Ron exhausted himself trying to find a way to be released, but nothing worked. After 18 years, Ron finally realized that even though he was doing his best to live a life of integrity and obey the word of God, pride still had a foothold. He took time and was one of the hardest things he had ever done. But he was finally able to pray, God, I am guilty of my crimes and I deserve to be here. Lord, I want you to to decide what is best for me. If you decide it is best for me to stay in prison for the rest of my life, then I am okay with that. After that humble prayer, everything began to change. Over the next two years, doors began to open, and events happened that were unheard of in parchment. All of this led to his miraculous release at his first parole hearing. Genuine humility touches the heart of God and allows our hearts to connect to His and provides the opportunity for the miraculous. And we'll read one more thing pretty well word for word. It's the short little contemplating the topic section. If y'all notice, normally about every Sunday I do read these two things word for word and then we'll try to, I try to get out of the book and cover it in a, in a more, I have a hard time listening to someone when they teach reading straight from a book. So when I'm doing this, I try not to read straight from the books. I, I want to read the highlights and, and discuss the other things. But then contemplating the topic. 
The entire narrative of Naaman highlights the role of servants. The story begins with Naaman, a servant of the king of Syria, being saved from his horrific diagnosis by a servant girl. His anger almost talked him out of a miracle, but his servants talked him into listening to the prophet. After his healing, Naaman returned to Elisha and in humility identified himself as Elisha's servant. The narrative comes to an end. This is the ending that I never heard of. As one of Elisha's servants was cursed with the disease of Naaman because of his greediness. Humbling ourselves is one of the hardest things to do. Becoming a servant of God will cause us to interact with a diverse faith community. Being a servant of God will also call us to be vulnerable in his community. Admitting that we have areas in our lives where we need help can be hard, but that admission allows the rest of the faith community to step up and provide care. Now, There it is. We can better serve God when we admit there are times we need to be served. I need help. Not kick my feet up while everybody does for me. There are times when we need help. Where we, we require the services of someone else. I want to give this a check again. Hey, we're still good. Now, the thing about naming very interesting thing here. He was a commander of the Syria army. Now we knew this. We knew he was a great man. Four distinct praises come from the scriptures about Naaman. He was captain of the host. He was a great man before his master. His renown because of his victories. High renown because of his victories. I mean, he just won battle after battle. You know, mighty man of valor. He was all of these things. But there was a, it's sad to say that all of these things were eclipsed. One distinct criticism, he was a leper. Now, it never really says how long he had had this disease. Was he hiding this disease as he was captain of the host, great man before his master, was gaining the high renown because of his victories when he was a mighty man of valor on the battlefield, when they just... His bravery no one else could compare to. But was he hiding leprosy then? See, we like to look at certain people. And I, it, it makes me remember uh, one year for Mother's Day when we played the, Sister Sheena played for the mothers the little video of the uh, redo, parody, whatever you need to call it, of the song. And they called it, I Have a Mom Crush. And the mom is talking about how, you know, I want to. I wish I could be like other moms whose houses are always immaculate. Doesn't exist. Um, kids are just always neat and well kept, and, and you know they're just perfect little angels. And you know, I just I, I all they're seeing are the highlight reels. They're seeing the pictures that are getting posted on Instagram, or Facebook, and all these different things. They're not seeing the real life. Under all that. That same person that you might be looking at, that same mother that this lady was looking at in the video, is looking at your, that they have their problems. They have things to, that they have to get over. They have their own issues. You don't see them. We don't see them. So we think that they don't exist. Oh man, they just have everything together. I wish I could be more like them. People probably looked at Naaman and said, man, I want to be like him. But they didn't know about the leprosy. In the culture of the time, if they had known he was a leper, he would have been an outcast. He couldn't have held his rank. He couldn't have done his job. He wouldn't have had an opportunity to have been a great man before his master because, there, oh, there's something wrong with you. You have leprosy. you got to go away. We see it sometimes when we go into, you know, maybe we go visit a church. And you just feel like, boy, this church just, boy, they just, everybody, everybody in here is just, boy, this is great. They're seeing you, you're seeing them at their best. 
when you stop by and visit a friend or a loved one, <laughs> well, you got to know, oh, I never known them to argue. Well, they were having a knockdown drag out as you were pulling in the driveway, but when they heard you, they hit the pause button on it and had a good visit with you because it wasn't your issue or any of your business of whatever the disagreement was over. So they kept it put under wraps until you left and then they would work it out later. It's always there. Everybody has the same problems that everybody else does. We just look at the highlight reel. Boy, I want to be like them. Some people might look at me and say, I want to be like him. Well, I'm telling you, it's hard. I, there's people that I look at and say, man, I wish I could be just like what they are. But also at the same time, the, the other thing that you got to plug in to the calculation on is I used to look at different people and say, you know, I want to be able to preach like them or I want to be anointed like them and I want to be this and I want to be that. But do I want to go through the things they went through for them to be what they are today? See, I'm looking at the highlight. I'm looking at the, 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 you know, boy, that was an awesome message. I wasn't there for the fight that brought that message on. I, you know, we're just going to talk about testimonies in a little while. Boy, that testimony was great. I want something like that. Well, there, you know, every testimony, there had to be a test. If you ask for a testimony like this one over here's got, do you realize you're asking for that test that they went through? So, Always remember, there's always more to something than what we see. Not that anybody's trying to keep something behind our back, or they're not trying to hide, they're trying to hide things, but it's just, it's what comes with it. Okay. Now looking at this next slide. The title of the section in your book is The Diseases of the Body and Soul Touch All Types of People. What is a lie? Because I am a Christian, God will protect me from pain and suffering. That is a lie. That's what that is. The Christian's ultimate hope is not that everything will be great on earth, but that there is eternal hope in heaven. Because I'm a Christian, God's going to protect me from pain and suffering and that nothing's ever going to go bad. I'm going to always have exactly the amount of money I need in my bank account. I'm always going to have a full tank of gas in my car. I'm always going to have a refrigerator full of food. That does not mean that's so. That is a lie. It gets told a lot. A lot of people think that it is, and when they see that it doesn't, it causes some shaky ground. The Christian's ultimate hope is not that everything will be great on earth. You're going to go through some wonderful times on this earth. You're going to have some very happy moments. Everything's going to be just fine for a season. But there will be times that it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be great. But that is okay. Because what we are looking for is and thankful to God about is for our eternal hope that we have in heaven. Now, Naaman. Naaman was an unbeliever stricken with leprosy. Just kind of breaking it down to exactly what he is at this moment. Forget about his titles. Forget about what he was. He was an unbeliever stricken with leprosy. At the time, it was just like the, it was the worst disease you could get because you're supposed to be outcast. You can't even come into town. You're just threw out to the side. Now, like I said, to give a little bit of backstory, the verses that they didn't use for this morning's lesson, Naaman, mighty man of valor, winning battles. When you won battles, when you defeated an army, you took, you took servants. You took people from the land that you conquered and you brought them back and they were, they were, they were, they served you. Well, there was a little servant girl, and she was a believer who was torn from her home and forced into a life of servitude. Totally different from the life that she had lived, totally against her will, did not have a choice in the matter. But she still plays a very, very strong role in this lesson. What do we know about this servant? Well, she was not actually Naaman's servant, 
She was Naaman's wife's servant. She was enslaved by a spiritually unclean man, and she knew the power of God through Elisha. She understood it. Through his teachings, maybe she, she may have met the man. I don't know, but nothing else. She had heard for, about him. She had heard about his teachings, and she hadn't forgotten. She's still even in her bad situation. And when she heard about her master's husband's sickness. She witnessed to others even though she was also on her own in a bad place. We want to go sit in a corner. Oh, I can't right now. I'm in a bad place. You know, if, you know, uh, oh, I can't teach this morning. I'm in a bad place. You know, we want to do things like that, but this young girl is in a very horrible position, but yet she never slowed down her witness. She went and told her master. She told the woman, hey, if he could go to the man of God, if he could go to this prophet Elisha, he would heal him. All he's got to do is go to him. Well, the wife goes and tells him. I might be getting ahead of what this is. Testify. Now, when you look, backing up a little bit to the book of Genesis, and, and, and I'm going to look right here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Hang on. Try to do one handed, it's not working. Be a good time for a commercial break. Hang on. I'm going to read the first three verses of, of Genesis chapter 12. This is God promising the nation to Abraham. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee and in thee all shall all families of the earth be blessed. All families. Mm. Almost look at the same situation that Naaman. Naaman was told to go to the Jordan. We'll get to that in a minute. He didn't want to go. Didn't make any sense to him of why he needed to go to the Jordan. Abram right here is being told by God, leave. Leave thy country from thy kindred. Leave your family. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Ain't even showed him where to go yet. You leave and I'll show you on the way. Hold on, God. Now, you know, if that, that doesn't make sense to me. I think if you should, Naaman said, he should have come out of the house and talked to me his own self. He sent his servant out. God, you show me where to go and I'll take off. If I know where I'm going, God, that's when I, that's when I, that's not faith in God. You leave. Leave your inheritance. Leave your father's house. Leave your kindred. Leave your country. And this is the promise I'm going to give, and it's not going to stop. I shall, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. No gender. It doesn't it say, in thee shall all sons of the earth be blessed. No ethnic or social. In thee shall all Jews of the earth be blessed. No. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. No gender, no ethnic, no social limit was placed on this promise. It's for everybody. There's another promise that's for everybody over in Acts chapter 2. Now, this is looking at trying to save, he's trying to get Abram to leave. Also to save his physical self. To set up what we're seeing in, even in today's time. Now, Acts 2, naturally, you know, it, it is talking about your spiritual. It's no, the promises unto you and to your children, your children, it's everybody. It, it goes on and on. There's no gender. There's no ethnic. doesn't matter. Well, this little servant girl understood this. I'm a little servant girl. You're rich. You're powerful. You can buy anything you need. Why would I need to, to try to witness to you the power of God? 
why would I need to send you anywhere? She didn't. She shared the testimony of God's power. See, here's the thing that I took from this the most. We love to hear people give their own testimony. And that's great. When you can draw strength from hearing someone give a testimony. 100% yes. But don't ever think you can't use someone else's testimony or it feels awkward. You know, this little girl did not go to her master and say, Ma'am, I had a peg leg and this, this, this prophet prayed for me and my leg grew back and I've been healed ever since and now I can serve you better because I got both feet. She did not have to say that. She just told of the man. She shared the testimony of God's power with Naaman's wife and it created a ripple because it went from the servant girl to Naaman's wife. The Naaman's wife went to Naaman and said, look, that servant girl that we've got uh, a couple months ago, you know, such a you know, how you, you know, you know, small talk goes, pillow talk, and it goes and goes and it's, um, all right, now, She's saying that if you were to go to this man of God, he could heal you of your leprosy. All because the girl wasn't so absorbed in herself, so absorbed in her own situation, she caused the ripple. She stuck her finger in the glass of water and it, just, it just spread. That's how testimonies spread. Don't be afraid to tell someone. Maybe you're there going through something. You might not can tell them, oh, I went through the same thing that you did, but you might know the testimony of a fellow believer who at one time, well, look, I, I don't know, but I know brother or sister so-and-so, they had a hard time with something similar. They made it through. Maybe get those two to me. Get somebody to talk to one another then. It never fails to be a witness. It never stops. There's no pause button. There's no, oh, I'll sit on the bench for a couple plays and then I'll come back. Being a witness never stops, no matter what our situation is. No matter who you are, what you've went through, all right, no matter who you are, your testimony has the power, whether you believe it or not, to create revival in your world. No, it might not be the revival we would like to see that's just community-wide, church overflowing into pews, people turning their life over to God, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, we want to see that, but it could create a revival in your world. It could create a revival in your mind. Okay, You're in your bad spot. This young girl is in her bad spot. You witness you tell of the power of God like she did. And then you see the person you tell about it benefit from what you said. How would that not uplift you? How would that not revive you, give you your strength back? There's no way that it could. It, if it did, there's something wrong. You're, you're deeply off a of deep end. If it didn't, oh, well, great. They're doing better. Ah, no. Oh, I'm glad to see that they're doing so good. But what was me? I'm still in my bad spot. No, get, you know, you're working your way out. Now, this young girl had no way to get out. That's the thing. We can come out of our mess. This poor girl couldn't. She was stuck as a servant, yet she still, no matter who she was, her testimony created revival in her little world. Now, Offended. That gets around a lot lately. We know, I know everybody gets offended by everything in today's time. But we'll look at some of that I'm on, in a little while. Well, maybe. If the Lord allows it. Because it's not part of the lesson. It's just a thought I had as I looked over this. Now, Naaman was not used to defeat or deny. You got to think. Naaman, I would gather that Naaman was the type of man that when he walked in a room, people stood at their feet. The conversations that were being had stopped. Maybe I'm thinking too much, but I'm really believing him being the commander of the army, the, the, the office, the, the position that he had in society, when he stepped into a room, 
there was a, you know, a reverence. Whoa, hey, name's here. So he was not used to defeat. Mighty man of valor. He, was, he was, must have been pretty tactical about himself. Very well can, uh, carried himself well on a battlefield. Not used to defeat. Sure isn't used to deny. So when he arrived at Elisha's house, you know, with his horses and his chariot, you know, probably a pretty impressive sight because I, he probably had the Corvette version of the chariot at the time. Um, finest clothes that you could wear. I mean, picture it now. You're picturing this man pulling up to Elisha's house, fine clothes, horses, chariot, just looking the best that you could look at that time. Steps off, doesn't even get to the door. A servant of Elisha meets him in the yard and says, hey, go down to the River Jordan, dip seven times. And the servant went back in. And this threw Naaman into a rage. I figured Elisha would come right out here his own self, put his hand over the bad spot on my flesh, and I would be healed when he prayed to his God. Well, what I read about Abram a while ago, well, God, why can't you just set all this up that you're promising me right here where I'm at? I ain't got to go anywhere. Why can't you come out here and heal me? Why didn't you send a servant out and I got to go? He orders him to go dip in the River Jordan. Jordan River, whatever. Now, the thing about that, the little note, that not all waters lead to the same conclusion. Been discussing a little bit with different people about the different versions of the Bible. Now, I know Sister Sheena taught a whole little class on, on that. And she sort of broke down. Now, we are straight here at Mount Vernon Pentecostal Church. We are 100% uh, King James Version only. Uh, I don't know of anybody that's ever gotten behind the pulpit up here and preached without a King James Version Bible, as it should be. Not knocking anybody that might not, but listen to what I'm saying here. Not all waters lead to the same conclusion. Not all Bibles lead you to the same place. Not all religions, despite what anybody may say, oh, well, we're just all trying to get to the same place. Yeah, we are, but there ain't but one way to get there. These other paths aren't going to get us there. Not all waters are going to lead. Naaman had to cross at least two other rivers to get to the Jordan. That blew my mind when I saw that. He had to cross. It was two or three, but I know it was at least two other rivers to get to the Jordan. Rivers that were closer, more convenient. Rivers that were cleaner water. So he threw a fit about that. Why do I have to go all the way to the Jordan? Why, 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 why? Because not all waters. There's only one way. Okay? Plugging that again. I hit Acts 238 a while ago. Plugging that into there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one water that's going to lead you to the heaven. The conclusion that we all want, there is only one way to gain. Now, why, what happens? Other things begin to pull apart and divide, and move over here, and change this over there. This isn't as important as you thought it was. This is more important than you thought it was when, when it is got to be 100% following what the Bible said. He had to follow what the word of the man of God said. Hey, look, I've got an issue. How do I fix it? Go to the Jordan River, dip seven times. Oh, he was disappointed. He had to be convinced by some of his people. His frustration with the prophet came to a, just to a boil, was the way they worded it here. And it was just, why would he even come out? He didn't even come to the doorway and speak. He sent his prophet. 
in his rage, he could have decided to gather his army and march onto the man of God. All right, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He didn't do what I, the way I wanted him to do. Let's just go back and kill him. He was expecting something great to happen. I'm an important man. Something great should happen. It should, it should equal to be what I am. Pride. Elisha needed, knew that, okay, this man needs to be humbled down, so I'm not even going to. It was a, Elisha knew what he was doing. It wasn't an accident that he sent his servant out. He sent a servant out because for this man to get what he needs, he's got to first humble himself. Now, one thing that Naaman must have been was a wise man because no matter how important you may or may not be or think may be or whatever, position, power, at work, society, wherever you may be, one of the most important things you've got to do is to surround yourself around people that are going to you will benefit from. Not people that you use. No, no. All right, he's already had one servant girl through the grapevine from servant girl to his wife to him. Tell him about Elisha. Well, when he throws his fit in his rage and, and just doesn't understand why in the world wouldn't demand, why would he send me to the Jordan and all this, his servant's wise counsel, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. All right, if he had told you to go do this great thing you were expecting, wouldn't you have went and done it? Amen. So, Ben, he said just go wash and be clean. Why don't you just go wash and be clean? Just go do it. Why not? What do you have to lose? It was an example of the simplicity of faith and humility. Yeah, you're thinking, Brother Matt, simplicity? Yeah. Yeah, Abram had to step out on faith and take up and leave the land that he knew. Naaman here had to take off in faith and head on to the Jordan River. He had to humble himself. You know, I thought he would come out. Well, I thought, uh, I think a lot of things. I think, God, this would be a whole lot better if it went this way or that way. God, I tell you what, now, I, I see what you're doing, but I just think it would have went better this and that. But God, to I always remember we got to have that faith and humility. But God, I know you're in control and not me. And it wasn't my call to make. Now, he ended up with some encouragement. And that word can mean so much to somebody. An encouraging word. Hey, I saw, I said, you know, I see what you're going through. I see you're struggling, but you're still fighting. Keep on. A prideful person, you judging me? What, what are you, you saying? I'm struggling. You saying you wouldn't struggle with what I'm struggling with? Who do you think you are? But somebody humbled before God would look at that and say, whew, thank you. I needed to know that somebody knew what I was going through. I needed someone to understand. I needed somebody to tell me something because I'm getting kind of lost here. But that pride can begin. You remember a few quarters ago when we discussed about it and a lesson on pride and it's talked about how a prideful person can become like a wounded grizzly bear. It just, it, it, or any kind of injured animal it will lash out at the very first thing it sees regardless of how helpful the person or the thing was trying to be. You know, if a veterinarian's walking through the woods and they come across a mountain lion caught in a, in a trap, they don't just run up and try to unhook it to set the poor thing free. No, they want to go through some steps to try to tranquilize it or something so that it doesn't rip their face off while they're trying to get it out of the trap. Now we can't go tranquilizing Christians but we need to realize 
We cannot allow, we've got to let go of pride as Naaman did. Abram could have, oh, whoa, wait a minute. No, I got an heritage here. This is my father's house. Well, brother, it wouldn't be in a literal house. Well, maybe it wasn't, but it was meaning he had roots here. He had things to fall back on. He had comfort there. We have comfort sometimes where we are and when we feel God telling us, all right, I know you're comfortable here, but what you need is over in your discomfort. Is over there in that rocky place. What you need is over there. You've got to go get it. We can be like Naaman and say, well, if it's for my better, I'm going. Abram packed up and left so that the promise would be to all families of the world. There was encouragement in helping these people move along. Although the men that named with Naaman were his servants, they still cared about him. He was surrounding him. He must have been very good to his servants and people that took care of him. Their words were never disrespectful. They never said, finally, he gets what he deserves. They showed respect for him by using reason to convince him to obey the man of God. They didn't encourage him in his agenda. Sometimes friends will take our side on things and will encourage us on our agenda and not... God's. They could have went to him and said, yeah, I don't understand what, I don't, that, name, I tell you what, that didn't make no sense to me neither. I can't, I, it's stupid to me. Let's just, just don't go. Just don't go. No. They went on. They convinced him with reason. Reason. Why can't we reason with anybody anymore? What happened? It's gone. It's not there no more. The ability is just about extinct. I know what, pride. Naaman, had, Naaman could have at any point in time looked at any of these servants and said, shut up. I don't want to hear it. The next person that brings this crazy plan up is, is, is going to be flogged. He could have in a moment, shut up. And then their respect for him would have done it. But he humbled himself in the position that he was and listen to the counsel of his servants. Hope I'm not chasing too many rabbits on that, but the humbleness, we cannot hold on to pride. Things that are all going on in the world today is too much pride. They reasoned with him. They convinced him to obey the man of God. They knew Naaman would have been willing to do anything grand I know I said that a while ago, but most likely because he could turn it into a grand show. It would match him. We don't match us. We match God. But they also recognized the simplicity of the faith that was needed, and all he had to do was follow the simple instructions of the prophet. Sometimes salvation, plan of salvation, repent, be baptized, and receive in the Holy Ghost can be seen like a major process. Whew, it just seems like it's so much. However, the hardest part is humbling ourselves before the Lord. The repenting, the baptizing, even praying through it and getting filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues is the sign, the evidence that it's there, is easier than humbling ourselves. That's why it is a true statement if one had ever been said that you are your worst enemy. You fight against you harder than any negative spirit, anybody that could come against you. You fight against yourself so much harder than they ever would. You do it. Hit the pause button on me right now. Get up. Go look in a mirror and look at yourself. There is your worst enemy. And without God, you're not going to feed him. Without his spirit to help you with this humbling process, you're not going to win. That, 
I'm sorry, that's blunt. Maybe that sounds a little cruel, but I can't, I don't, I don't feel the need to sugarcoat this right here. We've got to realize it's not me against them. It's not those. It's not however. It's me against me. And if I don't let God keep me in check, me will get me in a lots of trouble. Now, I know I kind of went sideways from this, but, and I hit this too. Well, not that. This is, this is, hang on. Now, I like this. Listen, he listened to them. No, now, he listened to them, encouraging. Well, the man said, go wash. Maybe you should go wash. Go to the Jordan River, as he said you should do, and wash. And he listened. By listening to what they were telling him, because they were reiterating what Elisha said, he was listening and obeying what Elisha told him to do. Now, there is something really scary going on in the world today. And church shopping. We might, some people call it church hopping. That's from church to church. Now, I'm going to read this just a little bit here. I can explain it to you. For some people today, Elisha would not have been a good pastor for them at all. It, would, it just, there's no way they could have worked. His actions could have been viewed as rude, unloving, and arrogant. Now, church shopping has become a trend. And it's not that they're looking for the ch a church person altogether. What people are looking for in the world today is they're looking out a pastor who will please, you know, I'm going to look for a pastor that's going to please me the most and fulfill my needs. What I want. I want to, you know, what I, how I want to hear it taught or how I want to hear it preached. I'm looking for that hip new, hip preacher, pastor that, you know, dresses in the way that I think they, in my mind, the way that a pastor should dress and, and ways that I should try to do and, and doesn't come against me in any kind of negative way and, and tells me I'm okay just the way I am. I had somebody tell me the other day, it, it was a joke, it wasn't a serious situation, but someone said, well, preacher, don't God say something, the Bible say something about come as you are, and I laughed and said, yes, it does, but it doesn't say anything about staying that way. Yes, come as you are, but then grow. So, you know, I understand that, but sometimes when you may think a pastor is being rude unloving or arrogant is actually them showing you the most love they could give in trying to head off a path that you're headed down because they're doing what a pastor is supposed to. But it's not what I want. Mm. Doesn't matter if it's what you want. If is it what God said. Naaman did not hear what he wanted when he went to Elisha. But he was given a directive of how to go about being healed. Now, church shopping has become a trend, seeking out a pastor who will please me the most and fulfill my needs. And when Naaman got upset with the prophet, Elisha did not run after him. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm sorry. Let's talk about this. Elisha didn't go after him. Elisha didn't plead with him. He didn't beg him. He left Naaman in the hands of God. Naaman, ball is in your court now. I did what I was supposed to do. There will be no blood on my hands. Now you do what you think you should do, whether it be what I have, what God's told you or whether it's what you think makes more sense to you. Even though Naaman was in a position where absolutely nothing was what he thought it should have been, for us to truly succeed, we need a pastor who will speak to us as God has commanded. Not what we wanted, 
not the pastor that, oh, we're just going to, you know, it's all okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and they're going to, it's okay you all the way to hell. A pastor that is going to tell truth as it is out of the Bible. Not watered down, not anything added to. I know I hit this last Sunday, but I'm going to do it again. Not a pastor that adds what they think to anything because when you begin to add, Adam and Eve in the garden, when Adam told Eve not to eat of the fruit, you know, Adam was told, I know I've done this last week, but I'm going to do it again. When Adam was told by God, do not eat this fruit, you shall surely die. When Adam relayed the message to Eve, if he had said, Eve, do not eat this fruit, you shall surely die. That's all Adam needed to have done. That was what the word of God said. Literal words. But Adam added himself in it and said, don't even touch it. So that when Eve began to have the conversation with the snake, with, with, with Satan, Lucifer, devil, whatever you want to call him, she's thinking in her mind, she is replaying in her mind the words that Adam said. Don't eat it, don't touch it, you will surely die. She pulls it off the vine, off the limb, off of whatever it was growing out of, looked at it and... He said, I would die if I touched it, and I'm touching it, and I haven't died. So maybe God was lying to Adam. Or maybe Adam misunderstood. So if I can touch it and not die, I must be able to eat it and not die. A pastor speak to us as God commands, even if, especially if it convicts the heart. What happened to conviction? What is Nobody understands what conviction is anymore. I'm going to give you a good example. Okay, if you, hopefully everybody, consider you have a pastor. Okay? You have somebody in, in your, I'm going to say religious part of your life that you look at as your leader. Using them. Can't nobody judge me but God. Well, hold on. Let's pause that thought and just example here. You have that person in the religious part of your life that you look at as a leader. When you see them pulled up in your driveway or you see them down the aisle at Walmart, if your first reaction for any reason is, <gasps> that's conviction. It's because something's not right. If it's not, oh, well, there's my pastor, or there's, hey, how? Same way with God. There was conviction there. If it convicts your heart, yeah, it might hurt. When you were a child and you got spanked, did it not hurt? When we go to our pastors and we don't get the instruction or we don't get the advice that we wanted to hear we can't get upset we've got to there was a lesson here a couple weeks ago wasn't it on you know respect to the pastor the hard job especially in today's time with all this pandemic going on we were discussing a little bit this morning how are we when are we going to try to ease our services back onto our regular system you know brother ray's been a pastor for 40 years He's never dealt with anything like this. He has never had to shut down services. You've had to cancel some due to different things, different events going on, or deaths in families, or different things. Sure, a service has been canceled here and there, but there has never been this long hiatus. We went several weeks ago. We didn't do anything in the church building. We were doing, Sister Sheena was doing this on Sunday mornings. I would do stuff on Sunday night or Wednesday night or some other nights during the week. I would try to do something just trying to still get the word of God out to our congregation. Now I understand it's YouTube now, so who knows who could be watching this from now and two years to come. And I hope you're getting something out of this if you are. But still and yet knowing that this has never happened before. There are stresses on pastors right now. They have never been there before. They're still worried about the congregation. They're worried about the flock. That's what they're here to do. 
They're worried about the people who were already on shaky ground and now missing these services can't have helped any. They're worried about how noticing our views on these videos are dropping. They're worried about knowing that the, what's going on around them. They see it. They understand it. No, Brother Ray's not computer illiterate. He doesn't know what's going on with a computer or a, a smartphone or YouTube. He has no clue, but he still feels the spiritual side because of God showing him and revealing to him what's going on, and he's worried. I'm worried. All pastors are worried. We don't understand what's going on around us. And I know I'm, maybe, I'm not on a pity party, but I'm just saying, okay, you come up to your pastor who is already in this moment. They may come across as a little rough. Maybe they shouldn't. I'm not saying that it's right. But when did we forget pastors are only human? When did we forget that we might have caught them at, you know, hey, they're going to stop what they're doing and talk to you if you come to them and, hey, I, I need to talk about something. You want to meet out at the church? You want to come by the house? You want me to come to you? What's going on? We're going to stop what we're doing and give you our undivided attention. Yes, but that doesn't stop what's going on. We're striving to continue to grow and work for the kingdom of heaven. We're still wanting the church to grow and we're still wanting it to flourish, but we still got to remember what a pastor's role is. It's more than just figuring out what to do about uh, services for a pandemic. It's more than just figuring out how to get around all these politically correct laws that the government keeps trying to throw our way. It's more. It's to be here. And when you go to your pastor and you get a word from them that convicts your heart, that is especially when you know I've got a good pastor because they told you something you didn't want to hear. They go out on a limb. They lay their head down on a chopping block in front of you when they do that. So don't get in your mind that they just, oh, I, just, I tried to go talk to my pastor and they just told me off. Wait a minute. How humble are you to God and to his man when you went up with your problem and when they gave you the word, when they gave you the godly advice of maybe how the situation should be handled, do you not realize how vulnerable that pastor is putting themselves out to you when that happens? So if you've got a pastor that'll do that, you better stay right there with them like hair in a biscuit. Because you're not going, those are getting rarer and rarer. I'm not against other, but it's getting to where it's all self-help. It's all God's going to bless. It's all God's going to do for you this. It's going to be a season of wonderful, great things that's coming. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. Where the convictions go? Where did the truth in its entirety of the Bible? Because if we do like Adam did and we plug in our own ideas on things, well, I see the scripture there, but I just don't think that's, oh, well, that's under the old law. Well, now you're, you're picking... You are picking and choosing now. That is a very slippery slope to be on. And if you've got a pastor that does everything they can to keep you online, keep you on that straight and narrow in a loving way, can't force you. Mm -mm. Cannot force you. When Naaman left from Elisha man, Elisha could not go put Naaman in a headlock and drag him to the River Jordan and dunk him in there seven times. He couldn't make it. He didn't chase after him. All right, you told me your problem. I told you what God said do. There you go. It is 
in your court. We don't want pastors to put it in our court anymore. We want the pastor to fight it for us. We want to put ourselves on the sideline. And just as soon as God puts us back together again and has us ready to, to get back in the game, we sabotage all over again so that we don't have to. Well, God, I want you to put me back together again because i have just put you back together again. And if a pastor is being a pastor, he won't be or she won't be afraid to convict your heart. Well, I know what they need to hear, but I just don't know if it's going to do more damage than good. If you say it in a loving way, the person may get mad. Naaman got mad. Naaman got mad. And he left in a rage. Elisha stood and, well, I told you. Well, we told you. Nabal, Nabal. Naaman had to humble himself to hear wisdom from people beneath him. I love that point. They were beneath him. And he still obeyed. He didn't obey them, but he followed their advice. They were people that were not telling him what he wanted. They wouldn't tell him, well, yeah, that bad advice. I don't know. Do what you think you need to do. He was made clean. When he crossed the two, at least two other rivers to get to the River Jordan, he was instantly healed when he was able to get himself out of God's way. When he got out of the way and obeyed what he was told to do, when we are born again, like Naaman did, said it, his skin was like a baby again, like a young child. When we're born again, we get that new start. Slate is white clean. Others might remind us of who we were, but as long as there's no new evidence to support what they're saying, fine. Let them throw it at you what you used to be. That's your testimony what you used to be. Don't be ashamed of it. Pride will keep you ashamed of it where you want to keep it covered up. Now, oh boy, I remember back years ago when you used to run the streets with me every Friday night. Well, yeah, I did years ago. But as long as they're not saying what you did last night or what you did last weekend, you're fine. Let them. Because I'm, that's, that's just a fact of life right there. Others are going to remind you of things that you did wrong. They're going to remind you of your past life. But if you've been born again and you get that new start, well, hey, I'm on the right side of God now, so it doesn't matter what I was. Now, if you just this past Wednesday, yeah, you're going to have some pretty, probably, recent events that can maybe support their evidence. But if you've been doing this for any length of time, you're, you can say, yeah, but that was old me. I haven't since I've changed. Hold your head up and keep it up. Naaman allowed his pride and arrogance to be overcome with humility. He didn't come right off. It didn't hit him like a tidal wave when he first heard what Elisha said to do. It didn't hit him and all of a sudden he said, well, you know what, yep, I'm going to go straight to that river. No, it come through a little. Pride and arrogance kicked in first. Our default settings always kick in first. The man knew what he was. He knew what rank he had in society. He knew, he knew his reputation better than anybody else. He was there when it happened. Now, when he was healed, 2 Kings 5 and 15, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Remember, in the beginning, he was mad because he didn't come out and pray to his God. Now it's, I know who the one true God is. And all of this comes from that little testimony from that little girl. I keep saying little girl. She could have been grown. I don't know. She was a servant girl. All of this came because she stood up even in her horrible situation. Now granted, it does seem evident that Naaman and his wife took care of their servants. But still, it's not the life she wanted. It's not the life that she would have chosen. Hey, look, 
her testimony set all this in motion. And at the end of it, now Naaman, the non-believer at the beginning of the story, is now a believer. 2 Kings 5 and 17. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules' burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. He's asking for enough dirt that it's going to take two mules to pull to take back with him. Because he wants to build an altar, but he wants to build an altar on the dirt from the very place he didn't want to go. Oh, what he dreaded the most, he is now in so much love with, what didn't make any sense to him in the beginning now makes so much sense to him that he wants to take some of it back home with him to use for a foundation to build his altar on to offer sacrifices to the one true God. He carried back a testimony. Little girls... Servant girl's testimony told to his wife, retold to him. Now, through someone else's testimony, he has a testimony. So don't be ashamed of a girl testimony. Don't be ashamed to tell someone else's testimony. Don't be so downhearted on yourself that you don't want people to know your testimony. Now, and God delivers. Elisha was offered, you know, hey, hey, man, let me pay you something. And Elisha refused the reward for the healing. If you are seeking for a divine solution from God, start with humility. It doesn't start with money. It doesn't start with, it starts with humility. Is there a place in your life that pride dwells? We, we stop ourselves a lot of times. We won't act on things that God wants us to do because people will judge us. I have to fight through the people's going to wonder who does he think he is thing. It doesn't matter. I have, God has to remind me. It doesn't matter what people, who he thinks he is. It doesn't matter. You've got to do what I've told you to do. People are going to judge me. I won't fit in. Well, if I, if I follow the, the guidelines of the church or because everybody's worried about rules, what you can and can't do, and I know that's not what my first thought was. Hey, look, before I can throw a bunch of rules, what you can and can't do, it, I'm going to show you have an opportunity at eternity. But I'm not going to fit in at work anymore. I'm not going to fit in. Well, no, you're not. But you're going to fit in with a so much better purpose and group of people. I'm too ashamed of where I come from. I got to keep it up. Or I'm free right now. I can do what I want. I'm free. I don't have to. I ain't got, I'm not bound by any religion. I don't have anybody to answer to. I'm free. All that is pride. Not being able to let go. Where are the people judging me? The people might think I'm not what I think they what I want them to think I am. That's pride. I won't fit in. That's pride. I'm too ashamed to admit I was wrong. That's pride. Now in closing, this is the ending that blew my mind. Like I said, past Sunday school teachers, if any of y'all ever taught me this, I, my ADD must have kicked in by the time you got to this part because I don't, I didn't remember it. But Naaman offered to pay Elisha for uh, healing him. And Elisha said no. This Gehazi story, I'm going to uh, read some of this because it's, it's, it's great. You saw what happens when a man lets go of pride, what happened to Naaman. Very rich man, very, very, you know, had what it, had basically everything he needed as far as a natural standpoint. Had servants, had esteem, had prestige, had all these different things. But then this servant, 
he becomes prideful and he tries something that we'll see right here. But 2 Kings 5 and 19 says, And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian, and not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Oh. Elisha didn't take none of his money, but I'm going to run him down. I'm going to get a little something, something for myself. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, It's all well. He's thinking something's wrong. He wanted to know if everything was okay. It's all well. You know, what's going on? What's the problem? You're, you're chasing us down on foot, man. What's going on? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there have become to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. This is a Hey, man, right after, he told you not to pay him anything, but right after you left, these two sons of the prophets showed up, and man, they... They're broke. They're, their clothes is all raggedy. Could you please give me a new pair of clothes for them and, and, and some silver? And Naaman said, be content. Take two talents. Double it. Just, hey, no question. Hey, man, no, no. Take two talents of silver, man. If it's helping out the sons of the prophets, here, ha have it. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags and with two changes of garments, and lay them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. Sent two of his own servants to carry it back with him. Naaman just jumped right in there with it, just quick as he could do it. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. He didn't want them to be seen. And he let the men go, and they departed. Hey, I got it from here. Y'all go on. He didn't want nobody knowing what he was doing. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? Hey, man, where you been? And he said, Thy servant went no with him. I ain't went nowhere. I've been right here the whole time. Elisha, you must be kind of losing your mind. And he said unto him, Went not my heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? God, Elisha seen the meat. He's seen Naaman light down off the chair. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Gehazi let pride and greed enter into his heart and he devised him up a plan. I'm going to have to tell a couple of lies but it'll be worth it because I'm going to have me a talent of silver and two brand new changes of clothes. And by the time it ended up he had two talents of silver. Seemed like he was doing bad. He was taking advantage of Naaman and he ends up with nothing. And the very leprosy that was on Naaman now went to Gehazi because of pride. God is able to work through those who humble themselves. It's not something God's going to do for us. Um, it's, God doesn't operate in ways where like a cowboy would break a horse. Where you know he jumps on his back and that horse bucks and bucks and he just stays on it, spurring it, pulling on reins, whatever he feels like he needs to do until that horse just becomes broke, becomes humble, and becomes a beast of burden from that point on. God doesn't do that with us. He's not going to jump on you. Now, yes, you'll see things. If God's got a direction, His will for you to live, I'm not saying things ain't going to get miserable, because I've said a hundred times before, and, and every other preacher will tell you the same thing. When I knew without a doubt that God was calling me to preach, but I did not want to. Nothing in me, never. 
So I was going to act like it never happened. Just, if I don't tell nobody, nobody will ever know. But like when Gehazi told the lie to Elisha, oh, I ain't went nowhere. When I stood right back here on the back side of the church, outside the double doors, and I said, Brother Ray, I feel like God's called me to preach. And Brother Ray looked at me and said, well, I know. Well, there went my plan of nobody would have ever known. But what got me to the point that I finally had to say something was I had gotten so miserable. I, I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't, my conscience, my conviction was just on me. Now, I could have ran from that or I could have humbled myself and said, okay, God, if this is the will you have for me in my life, I'm going to do it. True happiness, that's what everybody wants, that's what everybody's looking for, can only be found in pursuing the will of God. But I can't go out and do what I want to do all the time. I want to, have, I want to try to do a series somewhere. If I got to do it online, on throwing out, everybody wants to hit the what I can and can't do. Weighing out pros and cons, the pros so greatly outweigh the cons when it comes into finding this true happiness can only be found in pursuing the will of God. But I also just can remember the story was told of a church raised money for a playground. And they put the playground out right outside of the building and had it set up real nice, you know, like one of those, kind of like almost a McDonald's playground. It was a very nice playground. But they got to noticing that the only pieces of the playground equipment that the children would use is what was closest to the building. Well, still, you know, it was a good idea and wouldn't mind seeing it here. Eventually, a fence was put up around the playground. When the fence was put up, they noticed that when the children went out to play, they played on the entire playground. Because there, there was freedom in that fence. They could see, hey, I can go. I can go do this. I can go over here. Now I know where the boundaries are. They're visible. There was freedom in them. There was happiness. So the only true happiness we will find is in pursuing the will of God. And that's going to wrap this lesson up right there. Close it out. Um, sorry once again Sister Sheena's going to make fun of me I think last time I looked at it we were getting close to 150 uh, 100, an hour and 15 minutes um, so hopefully y'all are getting some comfortable chairs to watch these in um, if you're not in our group if you're not in our church uh, just to let you know this is Mount Vernon Pentecostal Church in Mount Vernon, Georgia Pastor Ray Wood if you're ever around this area, Montgomery County, stop by and give us a visit. If you're ever over around Toombs County, um, just off of Highway US Number One, uh, there's our sister church, Cornerstone Pentecostal Church, Pastor Henry Lamb. We would love to have you, and God bless y'all.